Thank you folks for being here. Thank you candidates for taking the time to be with us here, but also for running because that is a big, big, big thing in and of itself. Uh, as Chad said, I think it'd be great to just open up with some opening remarks, like in introduce yourself briefly and uh, share a little bit about what's prompting you to run this time around. Let's start with you, Kelly. Oh, can everybody in the back hear okay? My name is Kelly King. Um, a lot of you remember me from my first uh, three terms in office of the county council. And uh, uh, I think everybody knows everything about me, but I'll kind of go over basics. I've been um, in the same house in Kihei for almost 40 years now. Uh, my husband and I got into that house on a a federal program, which was affordable housing, and we're able to write out the 30 years and we're still there. Um, but we've raised two kids through um, high school and college here, and they're, they're adults now. I have two grandchildren on the Big Island. And um, <clears throat> I've been involved in all kinds of issues, from children's issues when my kids were young, the PTA, the, the neighborhood playgroup, building playgrounds in the different communities I've been in. I've also been involved in many, many environmental efforts, including renewable energy, which is our business right now. I'm the vice president of Pacific Biodiesel, which will be 30 years old next year. So we're the oldest biodiesel company in America. Uh, we also ran King Diesel for many years, which was a generator business that we started back in the 80s. And it's still on island. It's called King Power now, but it's been sold a couple times over. And um, I have a lot of experience in the environmental areas through my council work and through my position on ICLA USA, which is a global climate action organization that attends the different COP conferences and helps organize local environmental initiatives and funds local environmental projects globally. So I'm here to pick up where I left off. There were some things that kind of fell by the wayside after I left my last term. One of the very important things that I was disappointed not to see followed through is the Youth Council. And that was something I created when, uh, in my last term. We sat, um, we worked with about 30 to 40 uh, high school students. And then on, on the final day of the program, we sat them in the county council chambers, the nine of them representing our districts, and had them make proposals, discuss their proposals, defend their proposals, and then vote. <clears throat> And it was an amazing thing to see because at the end of that program, I asked the children, the students, how many of you would run for political office? And every hand went up. But none of those students, and after nine months of working with them and training them and teaching them how to research and how to deliberate, how to write proposals for resolutions, none of them were nervous. And that was just like, like the biggest, I think the biggest show of how successful that program was is that they were comfortable in those seats a lot of them, I think, are going to be our future leaders. That's a very, very important program. And a lot of the environmental efforts, too, that I've, um, I was the ordinances I was able to pass out as chair of the Climate Action, Resilience, and Environment Committee, I was disappointed to see that committee ended with my last term as well. So I think we need to pick that up. We've got, it's 2024, we have six years to 2030. And that's a, that's a huge deadline. We're not making enough progress. So um, I'd like to see us pick up the ball on that issue as well. So I'll, then, I'll stop there. Perfect. Thank you. Councilmember Cook. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name's Tom Cook. I'm serving my first term as the Maui County Council Rep for South Maui, and I'm running for re-election. My background, um, I've lived on Maui for over 50 years, married a girl from Makawa. I have five kids. They all graduated from high school here. Um, I'm a carpenter by trade, a contractor by profession. I'm retired. I ran for council because for years I've been, um, actually I was on political action committees and I've been an advocate for housing for years and years. And I wanted a seat at the table so that when we talk about housing, someone who actually knows how to build housing, uh, hands on, has a seat at the table. I firmly believe that our community has the ability to build we need the political will to build. Um, my daughter graduated from Maui High. She's a structural engineer. My oldest boy graduated from St. Anthony. He's a licensed surveyor. Um, I'm a firm believer that our youth um, who know how to build things and how to make things and have a high self-esteem are one of the things that we need to cultivate and encourage in our community. Um, mentoring youth has been an important thing to me. Um, when I was on the construction industry in Maui, we started a mentoring group with Maui High. And um, 
I can't express enough and encourage adults enough to reach out and mentor youth because many people, either from a single family household or a household that doesn't, that parents aren't in the same profession that a child is interested in, um, an adult taking care and encouraging them makes all the difference in the world. So I'm a firm believer that um, high morale equals productivity and, and uh, quality of work. And what our, country, what our government needs now is to be encouraging and advocating for people to build and uh, homes, businesses, careers, and not be so focused on the regulatory aspects. And so I'm glad to have a seat at the table. I'm really happy to be here today to have a conversation and get you to know, get you to know me better. And I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Council Member. And on down to the end. Hello, my name is Johnny Pronis. I'm born and raised here on the island of Maui. You might need to speak up. Or oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. My name is Johnny Pronis. I'm born and raised here on the island of Maui in Kihei. Um, I wanted to be in this kind of politics is because I want to be to put people first. You know, getting ideas, you know, working together to have transparency because in my past employment, I've been working with different people, you know, getting to know them and find out what they do. And, you know, because they've been going from job to job, you know, trying to get, you know, ends meet to provide for their family. And I guess the economy right now is so high that, you know, everybody is trying to strive for what they have to do in their kind of life style. So um, I work in the tourism industry and I like working with people. And then last is I get to work with people that is in nonprofit, you know, in the community. And my past previous job that I just left because I'm in this politics is I work for MEO. I was helping people to find jobs. I was an employment specialist you know, helping the community that lost everything during the time of the fire. You know, trying to get their lives back together. So that's why what I do is what I do. And plus, I'm also a volunteer worker at the American Red Cross, you know, setting up shelters in the time of an event of a disaster or hurricane or storm or flooding or fire. And this is what I do. And then the next one is I work at volunteer at the Humane Society, you know, caring for animals, giving them shelter or getting them homes for people that can take them in, being a foster family and providing what they need. And what we are, you know, trying to focus is the community and trying to get back our community. Because as of right now, as you can see, there's a lot of social media just pointing fingers at each other and trying to see who to blame or figure out who to blame. But right now we all need to come together and work, you know, you know, share ideas or, you know, some kind of transparency to work together, to find a compromise to build. Because right now what we need is we need to hurry up and rebuild and shape the community back where it used to be. Like right now, I want to bring back the historical sites, like the one in Lahaina, you know, the sugar cane trade, that's gone. Even the, the Maui County Fair is gone because the economy is so high, you can't compete with the prices around here. And the groceries are, you know, prices going high, gas is going high, you know. We're trying to try to, you know, see what lawmakers and legislators, you know, help everyone out so we can still be here instead of moving off the island. And why I run and run, run for this kind of seat is I want to stand with all of you. Be the person, be the model of you as me to be a representative for the community, knowing there is a voice for you to hear 
and we can bring it to the table. And, you know, I know it's about money here in Hawaii, but we need to step aside and focus on our people here, especially the Kama'aina. You know, we've been here for so long, we need to take initiative of, you know, never mind about the tourists or business people, because that's what they're here trying to do is to build whatever, but they're just taking and taking and taking and not providing for all of us that's been here a long time. So that's why I want to run for this office, to put people first. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'll throw you if you appreciate that. Um, I, why don't we go ahead and just transition right into the recovery effort. Uh, we're 11 months, I think, to the day uh, since the August 8th fires. Uh, what's the most pressing county level matter facing the ongoing recovery effort? Let's start in the middle this time with Councilmember Cook. Oh. Coming together as a community and deciding what Lahaina is going to look like. There was recently a set, um, the planning commission, planning department had a very productive meeting at Lahaina Luna uh, High School last Saturday. And um, one of the things that I recognized at the end of it was how diverse what everybody wants and everybody expects Lahaina to look like afterwards. So I'm hopeful and encouraging that the, that the administration and the planning department will be able to distill that and provide the leadership for a path forward as far as a vision of exactly what we're going to do. Um, the council, we've made progress with the emergency permitting process to abbreviate it so that it's 15 days instead of 300 days. Um, Four Leaf has been contracted from the mainland and they have extensive work with other uh, disasters and so that they're, they're bringing an expertise to our community to assist our community in our reconstruction. Um, the big challenge I see is water on the west side and uh, we, we have water but the sea worm is basically managing the, uh, the water and that's a state issue. I'm an advocate of the state and the county starting to work more closely together. And so when it comes to whether it's state historic preservation, whether it comes to the sea worm, that basically we're working together like really friendly neighbor, friendly relatives is how I put it. Because in order for us to plan and build extensively, we're gonna need state help. So coming to a common will, common vision is what I see is needed. Thanks. Yeah, let's go to Johnny. What's the most pressing issue um, facing the county right now with the ongoing recovery? Um, right now is, as you see on social media, a lot of natives are talking about, because there's big developments going on, if you see in McKenna. They want to build luxury homes, like 900 of them. And do you know what is out there? There's a lot of resources out there that people come to, like Kamaina people. There's beaches down there, and they want to build all these kind of stuff because it's along the golf course. And if they do build these kind of stuff, do you know what's going to happen out there? It's going to be like the mainland. Nothing less what Hawaii is about, you know. Because as you can see, this island is so small, we cannot take any more weight or a lot of people on this island. And look at the roads. It's getting too packed. And then traffic's going to be bumper to bumper, and especially like our highways on Honopilani in Kihei, the roundabout. We have to slow down, and people are not slowing down. They're rushing to get wherever they need to go. But the thing is, we need to think about each other. We need to help and educate the public that is this the world we want to live in? Because some kind of accident would have ever happened. That's why we need to, you know, set aside and put different 
issues and focus on these kind of stuff. Like, look at these developments. We're facing a crisis of homelessness. People are still in hotels. We want to find homes for them, but these rich people want to build their 900 luxury condos for these tourism, tourists. And that's why the combined people are angry and upset because they're not thinking about them. They're only thinking about the money and see how much they can get off of these people. Look at the apartment complex. They're making money off of people. But still yet, they didn't even start homes. What I want in this island is plantation homes, like the modern days. You know, how big of a family that they have. They can have like 10 people in their family. And that's still not enough to put people in that apartment complex. But that's why I want to, like the one in upcountry, if you see the new one, the new face, that is beautiful. I've been there. I love that kind of housing. You know, we got to think about the people that's been here long decades before all of us came here. Even you're maybe an international person or a settlement person that came from another country or the mainland or the states, you know? You know, it's like, have you lived off the island? Have you find resources? Because there's a lot of resources that you can just do it on your own instead of getting what you want. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, okay. okay, so we're talking about yeah. West Maui recovery. Yeah, What's, <laughs> what should the county be doing now? What's the most pressing issue? the county. Well, I think the county has been uh, dealing with the toxicity of the land and the water, and that needs to be completed first because we need to know that the shoreline is is free of all the toxins, or those at least the toxins are being captured. There are several different organizations that I know of that have been addressing that, and I don't think they've ever come together and as one and and talked about what each other is doing. So I think there's a little bit of overlap there, unnecessary overlap. So addressing that, addressing the water and utilities is important. While we have all this um, devastation and we're having to dig up the land, it's a good time to underground utilities and we really need to put that on the docket. We need to start discussing how we're gonna fund that through the county council. Um, <clears throat> there does need to be a planning effort from the community. I'm not in favor of putting that in the hands of the planning department because they tend to walk hand in hand with the developers and not really uh, figure out what it is that the community wants. And if you've I've been involved enough in the CPAC process from Molokai to <coughs> South Maui to have watched the um, the community kind of kowtow to the planning department and, and be roped into the process and not being able to get the full discussions out. But there's a lot of different sub-communities in West Maui and we need to bring representatives of all the sub-communities together. Not everybody's gonna get what they want but if we start with one common theme, right, right now everybody seems to be in favor of restoring the Moku'ula uh, wetlands. Those are the, oil, the ancient royal wetlands. If, if we can start there and start building around there and have that full discussion with the community and everybody gets heard, I think then we can come to some idea of what that community should look like. Not what the, the mayor wants or the council wants or the planning department wants, but what does the community want? Starting with the people who have stayed here and want to rebuild. So um, as far as permits go, I'm in favor of people rebuilding, being able to get their uh, permits quickly. I'm not in favor of giving permits out willy-nilly in, in 15 days because a lot of bad things can happen along with the good things. So there's a reason we have a permit process. But for people who or, um, had that devastation in the fire who want to just rebuild similar to um, their same footprint, yes, that should be moved along. <clears throat> But the thing that I've seen missing the most, and I've been gone for three weeks on a, a family vacation that was planned over a year ago, but so I don't think this was fixed in three weeks, but the thing that um, I see missing is a collaboration of the community. I see different groups coming out and voicing their concerns, but no one's bringing them all together to say, what is it that we can, we can agree on? Start with where we can agree, and let's talk about some of the other issues and where we should build, where we should not rebuild. We all know um, sea level rise is coming, so everybody should be conscious of that. 
and whether if you have a if you have a, a piece of property that's right on the coast and you want to rebuild, you're you're not going to have that for more than maybe 20 years. And all of those realities have to be part of that planning. A lot, and, and we have to let people know what's coming. So I think there needs to be a major education collaboration effort on the part of the county, bringing people together, having, you know, maybe a series of, of 10 to 15 charrettes where people come together and talk about what they want, why that, and we have experts there to talk about why that works and why it doesn't work. And then I think we can come to a, a conclusion of what basic parts of the community want to rebuild first. And, you know, my, my I was happy to read about the, the pretty much um, island-wide agreement on Mokuhuru because I think that's a starting point right there. Thanks, thanks. It's all super helpful. Um, one of the biggest questions I hear when I'm out and about, um, by far actually, and that, you know, your town hall the other week, town hall the other week, it was one of the first questions that came up. Some of the first questions your, you folks have submitted today is what to do about the Munitoya list, um, the short-term vacation rentals. Uh, I think it will probably be one of the bigger decisions the council makes and maybe as soon as the end of this year. I'm curious if it'll happen before uh, <laughs> November election or after. But regardless, I'm very interested in your folks' thoughts on the mayor's proposal. Again, this is to convert roughly 7,000 short-term rentals into long-term housing uh, in apartment districts. Um, it's playing out right now in the planning commissions uh, on each island. Uh, I think Maui Planning Commission uh, resumes discussions tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Um, so we'll see what they recommend, but that'll, eventually, that'll end up only mounting to a recommendation before it then goes on to the council for actual decision making. So, uh, Kelly, why don't we stick with you and then we'll work our way down the row um, and hear your thoughts on what we should do with that. Okay, well, um, I read through the bill, the proposed bills. There's no plan that comes with it, so it's just get rid of the Minatoya list. I'm not in, in favor of um, the way it's worded or the timeline that we're trying to do this in. We're talking about 4,800 units in South Maui and something like 2,200 units in West Maui. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's that many local people who want to live in tourist condos, to tell you the truth. I don't think, I think if you took those, those um, vacation permits away from people right now, there's no way they'd be able to rent them long term. I mean, we have 300 homes that FEMA rented for fire, wildfire survivors that have never been moved into, that they've been paying, you know, up, up to $11,000 a month to have an empty house. And people don't want to move out of West Maui. So the first thing to do before that proposal was even made was would have been to find out how many units would we be able to utilize long term if we did retire the minatorial list. So I would like to see, I mean, I think it's a good idea to talk about it and to start planning for it. And I would like to see a, a comprehensive plan, especially for South Maui, where we're, right now we're doing the South Maui community plan. How many units do we really need? How many, how many people would want to move into, as a full-time resident, move into those condos? And that's, I don't have a problem with people having to reapply for their permits. But I think some people should be able to reapply and have a short-term rental permit because I don't, what I don't want to see is we get rid of all of these short-term vacation rentals, and now we have to build new hotels. I do not want to see proposals for new hotels on the island. I was the instigator of the moratorium on ho new hotels because what we really need to do is go back to the Maui Island Plan, look at the amount of tourists that we had proposed should be on this island at any given time relative to the amount of residents that are here. We're way over that number, or we were before the wildfire. So how many tourists do we want here? How many tourists is our Maui Island Plan, uh, which I do view as regulatory because we, we voted it into law. Um, and, and let's make sure we have the units to house those people. We probably have too many units right now. So I have no problem with, with converting some of those units to long term. But I've talked to a lot of local people and they do not, they don't want to live in a condo. They don't want to um, move out of their community. Um, some of it could be, I think, repurposed for workforce housing, possibly. Mm -hmm. But um, I would like to see a plan, and I, I really, I was really disappointed to see the council approve a three hundred thousand um, dollar report just to talk about what the financial outfall of that would. Because we all know what the financial outfall. Look at what our property taxes are now. We're going to lose those property taxes. You, it doesn't take three hundred thousand dollars to come up with that number. The money should have gone into let's start developing a plan. How many vacation units do we need on the island? Let's keep some of those units that we already have. Why build new, why build new um, units and then leave stranded assets? 
And then let's figure out if, if we can actually convert maybe a thousand total of those units to long-term residency. We have people who want to move into that. Let's allow people who want to do that, because I know a lot of people who actually are doing short-term rental now that would go long-term resident, that want to help out the community. We have not, we, these, these are like knee-jerk reactions. We have not come out with a plan to say, here's what we need for our communities. Here's what the community can bear. Here's what our Maui Island plan says we should have in the community. And now how many units do we need? And one of my biggest concerns right now is the South Maui Community Plan. On top of the proposal to convert 4,800 uh, minatorialist units <clears throat> and the amount of affordable housing we have already in entitlements, because um, uh, whether it's 670 project, the Lakewood projects, uh, um, the downtown project, which I was the one who suggested they go to affordable housing from doing their, their shops in, in theater. Um, and then some of the recent projects that I helped um, facilitate when I was in office, which are the affordable rentals at Kaiwahine Village and the other one up above the golf course. Um, how many units do we really need? Uh, our, our community plan is proposing another 6,000 units on top of what we already have. If you put the other 48 units from Minatoya list, that's like 10,000 800 units. We don't want that many more families in South Maui. We can't bear it until we develop the infrastructure. So there's a real kind of a cockamamie way of going backward, of a backwards way of like, let's get to the, let's try to focus on the um, the pathway. And then let's, then we haven't even looked at what the end goal is. Yeah. So I think that would be my approach to it is let's put the money into developing a plan for how many residential units we need in South Maui, how many uh, and West Maui, how many visitor units we need in each of those areas, and let's if we if we need if we need if we can get rid of another you know thousand eighteen hundred, then let's make a long term plan, three to five years to do that. This is not going to happen in one to two years, and it will hurt a lot of people on this island to try to kick that in so quickly. Thanks, thanks, Councilmember Cook. Your thoughts on the? Um, I was surprised when the mayor presented the plan that he did because I thought that it was I thought it was a massive disruptive uh, decision without a lot of follow through I'm an advocate of providing more houses for our local people I'm not an advocate of um, trashing our economy I think it needs to be thoughtfully done member commas proposal for the three hundred thousand dollar proposal People have a plan. It's actually an assessment. Um, I feel that by identifying the homes, the apartments, condominiums that were made for employee housing during the hotel and uh, entitlement days, that's one group of housing that basically is potentially available. And <laughs> also um, identifying the the age of the buildings and the cost of maintenance for many of these buildings because the uh, association dues on many of these buildings would be prohibitively expensive if you added that to the rent. Also, as a builder, um, I don't think it's really good investment or very kind to our residents to saddle them with a 30 or 40 year old building that was built in Kihei um, that has a lot of maintenance, potential maintenance issues. So by basically identifying the the scope of the buildings, the number of the buildings, and not having it lumped together as just one transient vacation rental assessment. Um, I'm a firm believer that we can and need to build for our community. So it's not that is not the only way to do it. Um, look, looking at population, and I hear that I was was part of the, the general plan advisory committee several years ago when they came when the percentage of tourists and residents was projected. Um, I want people, there's more Hawaiians living in Las Vegas than living in the state of Hawaii. I want to build enough, I feel a responsibility to build enough homes for not only our current people and for the kids who are in high school and for their kids to be able to stay here, but also for friends and relatives to be able to move back because they had to move to the mainland. That adds up to a lot of people. That could be 20,000 homes over the next 15 years. It might be 25,000 homes over the next 15 years. Um, a lot of people, it's like, well, we don't want that many people. And it's like, if we're gonna, if we're gonna follow through with what people talk about planning for seven generations, 
We need to plan for our children, our grandchildren, and their grandchildren. We need to basically acknowledge the fact that Maui has a very diverse community. We have a lot of people, a lot of re relatives who want to live here. Mm -hmm. um, rezoning Kahului and addressing the um, a lot of the vacant land. We have places where we can build. We have the ability to uh, use the community plan to build where we have the infrastructure, where we have the resources, and where we have the need. So I'm not an advocate of single family homes from here to Pukalani. I definitely acknowledge that we have uh, acute limitations as this is our island home, maintaining our agricultural lands, maintaining our conservation lands, maintaining our open space. But I still believe that we can build and provide houses for our current population and bring our people home. So I'm not an advocate of kicking everybody out unilaterally from the transit vacation rentals. I think it needs to be done more with calligraphy instead of a barn brush. That's right. Appreciate that. John, what's your, what are your thoughts on this proposed conversion of uh, short-term rentals into long-term housing? So first thing is we need transparency from everybody, our whole community that lives on the island. <laughs> we need to focus on what we need here. And what we need here is homes for these people that lost everything or lost their lives. And want to bring back the memory that used to be here before even the fire even happened. So with that being said is we need to find resources and try to work with these agencies that we have here, resources and find a common ground to fulfill what the people want here. And how we're gonna do that is come together, you know, volunteer, you know, cause that's what I do all this past time that I've been on this island is volunteer. If you look at the past when the pandemic even happened, that's what I had to do because I didn't wanna just stay home and feel sorry for myself and not do anything. I just need to get out and do what I needed to do. You know, that's what I did. Red Cross being a shelter manager, setting up, you know, to bring people what they need in there. Feed them, give them clothing, find somewhere to sleep. I've been there 24 seven just to be in that kind of organization. And I feel good at what I did. Even the Humane Society, caring for, you know, cause animals are just like human beings, you know? Like your loved ones, like your <laughs> child, you know? Any kind of li living being. And then now that I'm in these community organizations, I get to listen to these people that come in and see what can I do for them? You know, getting the help, what they need. And that's what I'm there for, to listen, to see what I can do for them, and to give them what they want. Because that's what we're supposed to do. We need to give back to the community or paying it forward. I'm not asking anything back, you know? You just have a heart that you can give to any charity, donations, you know? church, you know, any, you know, volunteer fundraising, you know, that, because that's what's happening in our community right now. Everybody's trying to get donations so they can help these people, trying to get back to what they used to do, you know, because if you look at it, there's a lot of suicidal prevention going on, you know, but people are not telling us. They're just, you know, trying to see if that's the right thing to do or not. But as you can see, there is people out there that want to listen, want to understand, and they'll be there. So you, those people, has a voice and that can listen. But that's not the right thing of doing it. But right now we need to focus on the reality. You know, I know it cannot just bang, it's going to be there. It takes time. It's not going to come to you, you have to go there 
to figure out what they can provide you. But for housing wise, is we need to, you know, fix what we need to build here so we can get the community back where it used to be. You know, if you see it, have you guys gone to Lahaina? See all the devastated that happened? It's a little bit coming together, but we need people that can help with what we want. You know, if we don't have that kind of transparency, we might not even know what's going to go or what's the next outcome going to be. Because we're living day by day, figuring out what's going to come next, because we just had the pandemic. Now, the devastated wildfire, so what's going to come next? You know? Do you want to live in that kind of world? Find out, you know, that there is still life that we can still have here? But, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate that. Speaking of what's coming next, uh, some of the questions we have um, come around, when is Kihei going to flood again? Uh, chronic flooding issue, uh, a planning issue, it's an issue, it's a climate issue, it's an issue on all kinds of fronts. Uh, what are your thoughts on steps the county can and should be taking uh, to address this issue? Let's start in the middle. Uh, thank you for that. Um, live in Kihei, deal with the flooding, been a council member for the last year and been met with and, uh, dozens and dozens of people walk the streams. Um, we've, we've made great progress this year. And so far as the uh, Kalani Okoye Gulch, the um, is being cleaned out the sediment, 100,000 cubic yards. Um, NRCS is funding the first 30,000 cubic yards in a state and county uh, matching funds is going to take move the rest of it out. Uh, they're going to remove the sediment and move it back up on the pasture lands, Malka. The same thing, NRCS um, is working for um, the county. County approved, sent a letter requesting the federal government to do a grant, to do a study for the flood control for the entire South Maui. And so they're working on designing the retention basins that are necessary and um, to do a cost analysis and then get the funding. In order for us to, to, in order to mitigate the flooding in Kihei, we need to capture the water up Malka, retention basins, allow it to percolate into the, uh, recharge the groundwater, the sediment will separate out, the water will still continue to run to the ocean, but not in this abundant flash flood destructive manner. So um, I'm really happy with the fact that that's work in progress. We also funded in this last budget a million dollars for the uh, continuation of the South Maui flood control an analysis. Some of the some of the waters that are now going into the ocean should be going in the Kealia Pond because of the sediment Malka and then on by this by the bridge, the water is now diverted instead of going into the pond. It's going in to the gulches and flooding the roads. So it's a big issue. It's an, as a contractor, it's an issue that I feel really comfortable with. And I'm very glad to be able to have brought together the large landowners, the ranches, Bear, County of Maui, the state, the federal government, and uh, working in collaboration. And uh, we have traction, we have funding, there's projects being underway. You'll actually see the uh, sediment and the Kalani Okoye Gulch being removed within the next six weeks, they're gonna start. So that's sort of my update on flooding. It's gonna, it's gonna take <sighs> probably four to five years and it's gonna take about $20 million mm -hmm. to address the issue. The other aspect of it is um, the wetlands. We are working on, we funded um, $5 million. This was, uh, member Sinensi sponsored it and we, the, me and the rest of the chamber support, uh, council supported it to purchase property in two of the gulches and so that they're not developed. Some of the properties have entitlements already, so it's gonna be a little more expensive to buy it. I believe firmly that we should purchase, the county should purchase it, that nobody should build in those areas. And that's approximately 18 acres that um, 
can be reverted back to the wetlands. So right. that's my. Wait, let's come back this way. We'll make it mix it up, Kelly. Okay. Yeah. Flooding in Kihei. Flooding in Kihei. Yeah. I thought you were going to ask us to predict when the next flood was coming. Yeah. Um, now, the um, the infrastructure is a very big part of this. And when the CPAC finished its proposal for the South Maui Community Plan, in that was a policy, was a, a, a mandate that they voted on that the planning department has to do an infrastructure study to talk about what's needed before we do more development and a cost analysis. And the planning department decided not to do that and instead to send the plan on to the planning commission. So nobody has that information who's making these decisions. Um, we don't have enough infrastructure right now for the people who live there. I've been there 40 years and I watched Kihei grow. We were the large, fastest growing community throughout the 80s and 90s in the state of Hawaii. And there was no checks, no checks and balances. So when I was a chair of the CARE Committee, the Climate Action, Resilience and Environment, one of our, our um, our greatest, um, we had a lot of we had a lot of successes in the ordinances we passed out, but the wetlands restoration and preservation was one of the biggest things because we know that's why we're getting so much flooding in Kihei. We've built on too much wetland area. We used to have over 200 acres of wetlands in South Maui, and we're down to less than 25 acres. So that is job one: um, restore the wetlands because that's what holds the flood water. Uh, stop building on wetlands and flood lands. And I think I was part, probably the part of the council that maybe turned down the first proposal that the council has ever turned down for a development that was in a flood zone. It was in a flood zone, in a wetland area, <clears throat> and the proposal was to build up. It's built on seven foot stilts because then we'll be above the flood zone. Um, but we have to we have to take this seriously and we have to stop building in flood zones areas because some of the areas that are getting flooded, and I just met with a group of people who was who are fighting the North-South Collector Road because they're afraid it's going to cause more flooding. They asked me to come and meet with their neighborhood. And I did ask them, you, you understand that you built in a, you bought in a flood zone. They said, this we know. So um, I don't think it's the county's responsibility to mitigate every flood in a flood zone area. Those are the areas that nature sends water down. It's a natural pathway for the water. What we need to do is is redesign our drainage systems into biological systems. And I started that in my first term on the council with Eco Solutions coming in and actually making proposals for how to build, um, the, the original proposal was to harden and concrete our drainage systems. And so we brought in Eco Solutions to say, no, the best way to do that, to slow the water down and let it get absorption, is to build uh, biological systems that will that will have plants in them and grass in them because that brings the water down into the water table rather than sending it straight to the ocean. So we need to work on the biological drainage systems. We need to get that approved and funded. Um, I, I even, yeah, and I'm, I appreciate the fact that we're buying these two drainage systems, but we have more than two, or these two ditch systems. We have more than two ditches in South Maui. We have a lot of ditches in South Maui. We can't necessarily buy them all, but we do have to tell people I'm sorry, but you, you can't build here because we can't we can't mitigate your flood issues if you build in these areas. It's not fair. And it's really not fair to say that's where all the affordable housing should go. So, you know, the people who don't can't afford it to fight it, let's put them in the flood zone and then when it happens they, they, they don't have money for lawyers. Um, <clears throat> I think water storage up country is a big issue and that was one of the things I testified at the CPAC was um, as you make your your infrastructure policy proposals you need to have a working group that meets with the folks in Kula and up above um, the, where, the, where we're getting our flooding from. And we have to come to some mutual decisions on how we're, the water's coming from up there and there's very um, uh, there's a lack of water storage. And if we could find some way to make movable water storage so we can, I mean, this has been, since I've been involved in the county for the last 20 years, um, all I've heard from the county water department was, Maui has enough water we just don't have it where we need it to be. So it's flooding in some areas, in some areas we have droughts. That's why water storage, I think, is gonna be more and more important as we move forward is we need we need to, if we're gonna, I'd like to see us put the money, I mean, the, the council almost sent us into a contract with a mainland venture capital company that was going to own the water system up in Kula for 30 years and charge us 100 times more than what we're paying now as a county. That, if, you, if we have the, water, the money to do that, let's put, let's put that money into water storage right now and start building systems where we can move the water to where we need it when there's a drought. 
And, you know, people talk about that. There's nothing, there's not ever been anything done because we haven't been able to coordinate the two different communities, the communities that, where the water comes from and the community where the water goes, where we, where we, have, um, where we have the flooding. So, you I know, mean, I'm a huge advocate of nature systems. And if, if we know, I mean, water naturally runs downhill. And there's some areas that it's going to run downhill. And we can't be promising to mitigate areas that are, are the natural flood zones. We just have to stop building on them and maybe relocate folks who are in those areas. Uh, but I, I think that's going to get us there quicker. Uh, I was, the last time I went to Aquilo in the Laie wetlands with Trinette Furtado, Furtado who does great um, spiritual Aquilos in the wetlands, it was right after a storm. <clears throat> And we couldn't even go into the wetlands. We were standing at the, the part of the wetland facing the South Kihei Road, right next to the sidewalk, because it was all full of water. And all I could think of was, isn't this great? The wetlands is, are doing their job. They're holding all that water. If the wetlands weren't there and we weren't restoring it, all that water would be in someone's backyard. Um, but that's the natural flow of things. And if we, we didn't respect it back in the 80s and 90s, and so it's costing us now, we're going to have to go back and do a lot of repair. But if we continue to do what we did in the 80s and 90s and just keep building and building and telling people we're going to mitigate your problems after you get the flooding. We're going to just push this problem onto our next generation. And, you know, for, for someone who was a young mother back in the 80s and 90s, wasn't paying that much attention to politics, but understood the, the level of construction that was going on. You, I was working with the schools to help the teachers get air conditioning because they had to, in order to even have any air come through because it was so hot, They'd have to open the louver windows. <clears throat> They'd get dust and wind in there constantly. And the teachers I talked to, they had really hoarse, hoarse voices. And they said, Kelly, this is not how I talk normally. It's from, you know, days and days of sitting in these classrooms. So we, we've got to look at the big picture of things and not just individual projects. Part of it is, what are we leaving to our next generation? You know, can we fix this problem instead of just pushing it down the road and saying, you know, we're going to try to mitigate some of the, and I, and I said this to the families I met with in, um, on the corridor of the North-South Collector, that some of your problems are just not going to be able to be mitigated because you bought into a flood zone. And um, I think more and more, people, there has to be full disclosure when, when you're selling properties. If you're in a flood zone, if you're in the sea level rise area, if you're in a wetland area. And our, our, the other thing that the wetland ordinance was designed to do was to broaden our definition of wetlands so we could start looking at the lands that we've lost. It's uh, a, a piece of property doesn't have to be wet to be a wetland because we've lost a lot of that capacity for the wetland with our with our um, development. But it could there are a lot of those properties can be restored to wetlands, and that's what we should be doing. That will actually alleviate a lot of the flooding that's happening in, in South Kihei. Thanks, and Jenny, uh, I'm sure you experienced. <laughs> Probably plenty of flooding growing up in Kihei. What, what are your thoughts on what should be happening there? So, how many of you live in South Maui? Raise up. Okay. And you see all the flooding and the debris that goes on the road every time there's a big storm. So, climate change every different days or every season. And for this year, it says it might be getting hotter, just like last year. I'm sorry, with the devastated fire that, you know, it's going to get, like, this cup last week was 98 degrees outside. And, you know, people are getting hotter every day or um, looking to buy uh, air conditioning or, you know, going to the beach or going to the pool. Lucky we have that here in Hawaii because some different states, they don't have that, except the river, if they can drive like maybe two hours from there in the states. So yeah, we are so lucky that we live in Hawaii and it might be just right across the street from where you live or down the road, you know, just a walk down the road or taking the bus and yeah, so being said with that is flooding, you know, it's our kuleana to help each other out, you know, because don't we want to live towards the future, you know, because it's our duty. We play a role in every, everyone here in Hawaii and 
especially in Maui. And, you know, to work through this kind of devastation that hopefully it doesn't happen again. We need to fix what we need to improve here, you know, and clean up, you know, because I do a lot of volunteer work, like cleaning up the community on the beaches or uh, on the roadways, picking up trash, you know, you know, because this is my home. I want to preserve and protect what is left for us here. And it seems that our resources are all running out because everybody just take and take and take. And then with the flooding, it's like, we don't want to see this kind of devastation that happened in the past. Like we just lost a very dear firefighter that had to rescue somebody in, in the canal underneath the ditch because somebody wanted to play. And why would you want to be in that kind of situation? That water is so dirty, it's not clean for all of us. You don't even know what's in there. And then picking up, you know, all the money, and it costs money to fix everything. Trying to clean up, redo everything, you know, and we don't want to see that anymore. That's why we need to clear all the ditches, branches, and then if you see, I see homeless people living in the ditches, in the canals, making homes, because that's what they do. They don't have nowhere to go. So my focus is to help the homeless people get into shelters, what they need, because people have mental illness, and that's what we need to get them help. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we're coming up on the hour mark. If we could go through one more question, and then I want to make sure we allow time for you folks to be able to mingle and meet and greet you guys up for that. Sure. Okay, great. Um, this one uh, was actually on my list and came from folks here today, uh, and it deals with studies, uh, whether we were talking earlier about the fire studies or flooding studies or the $300,000 housing study. Uh, how, how do we ensure that these studies that we have already or they're coming up basically don't just sit on the shelf. How do we make sure they're actually implemented and followed where it makes sense? Um, Johnny, let's start all the way down at the end with you and we'll work our way back towards me and we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, starting with the fires and high housing crisis and homelessness, there's a lot of topics that we need to fix here in our community. But the number one priority is housing for the fire victims because you know they're running out of time you know either they're going to be homeless or they're going to have to move or they might have to live with families or neighbors you know try to take them <coughs> in and that's what we don't want we want to give what they want because they lost everything they have nothing so we need to help them and give back they want to get or rebuild what the foundation was in their homes and getting them, you know, what they need, like health care or, you know, bills to pay and, you know, because it, it looks like, you know, we're just charging everybody, you know, I don't know for what reason, but if I was in that kind of situ situation, you know, I would feel awful. Like, for me, because I'm running in this kind of campaign, I don't expect any donation. I just want all of you to have a heart and just give, you know? Even if it's just a little bit, not a lot, but just what you can, you know, conserve or achieve and that's like one of my three words that I put in my brochure, you know, dreams, future, and a voice for all of us here in Hawaii, you know, because we want to give it to the next generation, to the future for tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks. That's where we we'll cook. Uh, what would you do to ensure that studies don't just end up sitting on shelves and we actually take advantage of all that work? Um, 
It's, it's a great question. When I came in the office and I asked for updates on CIP projects and just in general trying to assess what uh, what work in progress and the status, it's um, a lot of, a lot of um, spreadsheets. What I asked for is float, uh, Gantt charts. And a Gantt chart is basically a very common thing for construction, which basically shows the planning, the execution, the finish, the punch list, et cetera. And, um, it was interesting because the departments were like sort of smiling like, okay, this guy kind of knows what he's talking about because that's how it's easier to be held accountable because it's actually a more efficient, effective communication tool. It's a very common tool. So to answer your question, broad strokes, it's to be asking them for updates graphically mm -hmm. and that it's easier for lay people to understand um, to be able to see the process and the progress instead of burying it in a whole bunch of numbers that um, you can do an assessment as far as percent complete, percent spent, balance to complete, but it isn't very visible. So um, a big part of it too is communication. How do we ensure that uh, plans don't sit on a shelf? It's communicating with the departments, uh, encouraging people in the community to write letters and ask me as a representative, what's the status of this? Our department at our uh, office reaches out to the various um, departments and ask, what's the status of this? So accountability is basically um, the process of being in office and managing. So uh, I will say, I, I wanna add this, people will often mistake a study. So like when people say a traffic study for a development, they'll go like, we don't need a study. There's choke traffic. I mean, it's like I'm sitting in a, why do you need a study? A study often, it basically really what it is, is, is an analysis to determine the various things. Are we going to put a stoplight? We're going to put a stop sign. We're going to put a roundabout. We do we need another road? Do we need another lane? It isn't simply a study to determine that we have to prove that we have too much traffic. It's an assessment for the traffic at bearing capacity on that particular road. I'm an advocate of building a new parallel highway with the Pitilani Highway Malka. It'll take years, but if we get the uh, right of way established with the landowners, and so that's the biggest challenge in the future. When I talked to the Department of Transportation Director um, Sniffen, he basically said, Tom, right now the Pi'ilani Highway doesn't have the uh, capacity, the, that overcapacity that needs a new road. Now, we that live in South Maui would somewhat debate that, but I encourage you, it's like if you go on a Saturday or a Sunday or if you go early in the morning, certain times of the day, the road has hardly anybody on. When everybody's going to work, everybody's going to school, everybody's going shopping, then there's a lot of people on the road. But it isn't like Honolulu where you have 24 hours a day, uh, extensive amount of traffic. So I'm just sharing with you as far as the study, sometimes it's putting it in perspective and, and educating people that as far as like um, why you're doing the study and if they feel that something is out of control, asking them to stand back and maybe get on the road at a different time or to in general, weigh in on your concerns. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks. Appreciate that. And last but not least. Okay, do you want to repeat the question? <laughs> yeah. Uh, basically, at the county, you know, commission's funds it requires does a lot of studies, but often the criticism is they end up just sitting on the shelf. Uh, so, as we're looking to fund additional studies, you know, how do we ensure that they're actually taken advantage of, utilized, not just collecting dust? Okay, stop doing studies, first of all, and start doing action plans. And, you know, when I, in my last term on the council, we, we, we funded an action plan for affordable housing. Uh, oh, Council Member Johnson, who just walked in the room a little bit ago, um, <clears throat> chaired that committee, and uh, we started going through the action plan and actually passing components of it. But the difference between a study and an action plan is an action plan Studies can have recommendations. An action plan will actually have a timeline of when those recommendations should be done, who's responsible for them, and how much they're gonna cost. That's an action plan. 
What we got, unfortunately, with the climate, it's called the Climate Action Plan that got passed through the council. It was really a report of where we're at with, the, with um, our climate change issues. It didn't have a timeline in it. It didn't have responsible parties who were doing those actions. And so it really never should have been passed as an action plan. It was just another report. And that's one of the problems is that people don't understand the difference between a study or report and an actual action plan. Action, the action plan it holds people responsible because you come up against a timeline and you go, why hasn't this been done? And sometimes it's the council's fault for not funding it. And sometimes it's the department's fault. But we need better qualified people in our departments so that we can stay on top of these things. One of the things I think that's missing, and I started talking about it in my first term um, on the council when we went through budget, um, but I've seen this every year, is we don't really have strategic planning in our departments. When you look at their uh, performance measures, there's not a strategic goal that then has objectives of how to get to that goal. And I'll give you one example, <clears throat> because this is the epitome of a study versus an action plan, but it's just the way of thinking. That um, the, the Corporation <coughs> Council, um, one of their goals was to reduce the amount of lawsuits against the County of Maui by holding workshops and doing outreach. And the way they measured it was how many workshops they held. Not by how many, uh, how much less uh, money was we were being sued for. So, I mean, you know, there needs to be an understanding at, the department, at our department head levels of what strategic planning is. You set a goal, then you set objectives for how to get to that goal. But you measure the goal. You don't measure the objectives. You don't measure how many phone calls you've made, how many meetings you've had. You measure, are we, are we getting to our objective at that goal? And that's one of the things I think that's missing big time in our administration is that idea of strategic planning how to hold people accountable for timelines, um, hiring people who know how to do that and know how to bring their department together to develop a strategic goal. Because I've done that in my company for many, many years. And when you involve, we have about 100 people at Pacific Biodiesel. When you involve everybody at every level, then when you go to, to um, launch the different aspects of that, of that um, strategic plan, everybody's bought into it. You know, we don't have that here. We don't have the department's all working together and saying, you know, here's here's why that won't work or that will work. People at the ground level or, the, you know, most of the people in the departments are civil servants. And they're just a lot of times waiting out the department leaders because they're going to leave in four years when the mayor retires or when, you know, the, the mayor doesn't get reelected. We need to have everybody working together regardless of their status on a strategic plan, set the timelines, set the, set the benchmarks, know what the costs are, and then have those, um, have the the departments report on those um, benchmarks at, the, at a you know, timely manner. When I, when I first came on the council, every community plan had this almost like a book in the back of it of implementation items. And there were you know hundreds of implementation items for some of these community plans. Nobody had ever asked for a report on it. So I think I was the first person that said, can we have a report on which of these implementation plans is actually being implemented, You know, in, when they're being implemented, what the priorities are, and you know those those um, formats are very important to, to keeping um, the communication between the council and the departments alive and and active. Um, but um, whenever you have a study or report that just makes recommendations and doesn't tell you who's supposed to do it and what in what um, time frame, you're not going to get action. You're going to get a dust covered report in a couple of years. Thanks. Thank you. All for, uh, those are really great things for, for me to look at, too, as a reporter when I'm wearing that hat uh, to see what actually might be happening or not. Um, but I also just want to thank you folks for taking the time uh, to be here, for you folks, for your interest in actually who you'll be electing. Uh, all nine seats, if, if for those who don't know, are, are up. Um, all nine incumbents are running. A couple of them are unopposed. But uh, and of course, in Maui County, uh, everyone votes for everyone, regardless of district. Top two uh, in August will advance to the November general. Uh, but again, thank you all, and please stick around, mingle, and uh, we can chat more informally after this. Thanks. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks.